Welcome to the Gazelle School of Business webinar on hiring your first office assistant. No, on landing the five-star review. This is one of the many topics, uh, one of the many free webinars we're offering to the piano service industry. That'll cover every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. Um, we are actually going to put up a new set of slides here for you because we have a different set of slides that we have right now. Um, but while we do that, <clears throat> just want to tell George, you about- George, I think that these might actually be the right slides. Um, it was just a typo on that first oh. slide. So how about we just dive in and let's well, hope we're we'll doing the right, right webinar in. here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's um, nothing is ever exactly as you plan it. <laughs> Especially yeah. reviews, right? So um, Nathan's going to be moderating the chat and the Q&A, so you can ask your questions there, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. All right, let's dive right in. So start to finish, uh, the application time for this webinar is probably less than one hour of actual work, plus whatever amount of time you need to spend practicing and refining the application points. So I'm George Buss, your personal business coach with Gazelle, and today I'm here with Timothy Barnes, a registered piano technician and the co-founder of Gazelle. You shouldn't have to wonder why you didn't get an online review. If you're going to do good work, you deserve to have your customers talking about you, but it's not always that easy. In today's world, online reviews are sometimes equated with word of mouth advertising but online reviews are much more powerful because one great online review will send a lot more people your way than a single person telling one other person once every five years. And George, you know, early in my career, I remember struggling to get word of mouth going in my business. I was doing good work and I tried all kinds of things, but nothing seemed to make a difference. And when online reviews became a thing, I still hadn't figured it out. And I was asking the same question, but it sounded more like, how can I get my customers to give me an online review? Again, I tried, but nobody seemed to follow through with it. Well, knowing what I now know, landing tons of great online reviews is actually easy if you invite your clients to be part of your story, make it easy for them, and create better customers. Let's start by talking about step one, inviting customers to be part of your story. This is the key to getting lots of great online reviews. So how do you do that? Well, doing good work isn't enough. Landing tons of five-star reviews doesn't happen by accident. You either intentionally create a great experience for your customers and then intentionally leverage this into a review or you do nothing and you get poor results. Now, creating a great customer experience is often generalized in the term customer service, but you need to instead think about this in terms of what was the very first impression your business made with this customer? And this does not happen when you ring the doorbell. It happens before you pick up the phone, before you reply to the first email, before they take a look at your website, and long before they read your bio page. It happens when they ask, do you have five-star reviews? Their very first impression of your business is going to hinge on this reality. Now, as soon as your customer searches piano tuning near me, They'll check to see how many five-star reviews everyone has accumulated. And at this point, they're just scanning and they're starting their research process. They quickly find the company with the most five-star reviews. Then they benchmark that against other companies. And they scan for things like negative reviews and um, fake positive reviews, right? They might read a few positive reviews, but really what their brain is looking for is a reason to not trust you. Subconsciously, they're most interested in avoiding the failure of a bad experience and avoid the failure of hiring a fraud. Then they're interested in finding the best piano technician in town. So right now, their brain is subconsciously asking the question, how bad could this experience be? They're looking for danger. 
the customer tries to put themselves in the shoes of the people writing your reviews and they're asking, could this be me? Could this be my experience? They're looking for insight into how your business treats its customers. The positive reviews tell one side of the story, but our best intentions are tested through fire. So if there are negative reviews, they'll jump to these and they'll look for your response. All they want to see is a good response that makes them believe if they have a problem, there's hope for resolution. And your reviews set the expectation and start your promise and fulfillment cycle. This is the first moment your customer starts to subconsciously form their expectations for working with your business. Prior to this, their expectations are a blank slate, but now their expectations cause them to either want to learn more or quickly walk away. The first promise they discover is found by scanning your online reviews. And assuming you have some five-star reviews, their brain jumps into action and starts using the promises they see in your reviews and framing them into an expectation of fulfillment. Every interaction they have with you from this moment forward should continue to tell the story being told by your online reviews. Now, if you have a website, this is usually their next step. So does your website reflect the same narrative of your online reviews? Next, they're going to text, call, email, or book online. And all four of these happen uh, all the time in various orders. Now, if you don't have any reviews, this phone call is going to have some tension because the stakes are high and you have to make a good impression. But if you have great reviews, there's a lot less tension here because new customers start coming to you from a place of trust instead of distrust. And this is huge. Next, they're going to book an appointment, receive some automated messages, and look for consistency with their expectations. And then you're gonna arrive on time. And if this isn't something you already do, then start promising to do it. And tell the client you're gonna call if you're running a little late. So few companies do this that it stands out in your client's minds. And this becomes just another part of the story you're building with your customers. And the more you can fulfill on a ton of little promises, the more trust you will have when you walk in the door and the greater opportunity you're gonna have on the backside of the appointment for an online review. The more you fulfill on these little promises, the more trust you build, the greater the potential for that great review on the other side. And now you ring the doorbell. This is at least the sixth touch you have with the customer. And it is your first face-to-face -face interaction. Everything up until this point has been the promise of things to come. But the moment you arrive, everything shifts to fulfillment. This is your in-person opportunity to deliver on their expectations. And when you shift to fulfillment, you need to be intentional. The first point in your in-person fulfillment cycle is going to be all the nonverbal ways you exhibit modern day etiquette. Are you respectful of their space and their presence? So is your phone on silent? Do you look them in the eye? Are you dressed well? Are you respectful of being in their home? This also includes really important things like, did you smile? Are you good with people? Were you professional, knowledgeable? And did you solve their problem? Essentially, does their piano perform better now than when you first arrived? If you step back and think about it, your customer has taken a journey of small steps from hope to promise, to expectation, and ultimately to fulfillment. Your customer invited you into their life. At each step of the way, you had a chance to give them a positive experience and a reason to give you a five-star review. You either became a trusted guide in this process or you leave empty-handed because of missed opportunities. And you have to earn this. You don't earn the right to ask for a five-star review unless you hit a home run and guide them successfully through their journey. When this is true, and only when this is true, will you start landing tons of great five-star reviews. 
But if you've been swinging for the five-star review and just knocking it out of the park, you have earned this. But even fulfilling on your promises and knocking it out of the park isn't enough. And most piano technicians who care about their work are probably going, okay, check, 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 check. I'm doing all of this. So why am I not getting a ton of online reviews? And if you're not careful, it can feel like the only thing left is to start begging for a review. So let's be clear. You are not begging for an online review. But you're also not asking for something unreasonable by asking for an online review. Part of the problem here is that it is easy to think of a review like a tip that is solely based on the goodwill of the giver and something that is above and beyond and not expected. But a review is not a monetary tip. Now, if you ask around, most piano technicians expect 0% gratuity. They do not ask for monetary tips. But because a review is not a monetary tip, you should get paid and get a five-star review on a regular basis. If for no other reason, because you're being intentional and working hard for that review, these are your wages. I think because most piano technicians expect 0% gratuity, they start to develop this identity as someone who doesn't need tips. And then they transfer this identity into their view of online reviews. Because for them, online reviews and tips are in the same category. But you need to take them out of the same category and put them in their own category. And take the mindset that you're intentionally working for the five-star review. You're investing in your customer's experience, fulfilling on your promises, and making it so easy for them that they enthusiastically say yes and then do it. The truth is, Online reviews are just another form of currency, and you've earned your pay. So on a regular basis, start saying, I don't need a monetary tip, but I would like to be paid with an online review. You're going to build your company with the kind of people who love and understand the currency of writing great reviews. So up to this point, we have improved your promises and expectations. You've knocked it out of the park and started viewing online reviews as necessary instead of optional. And this is a great foundation to focus on the next step. You have to make it easy for them. If you don't, all of your hard work will have been wasted. Now, Nathan just dropped a downloaded guide into the chat channel for later. That will be a great resource for everything we are about to talk about. So go ahead and just bookmark this URL and let's dive in. Now, making it easy goes beyond just making it easy for your customer. You need to also think about making it easy for you to run your business and easy for your customers to do business with you. Because if it's not easy for you, you will never ask. And if doing the review isn't easy for them, they will never do it. So let's back up and start with the idea of making it easy for you, because this is the first step towards making it easy for your customer. George, I think you're muted. You need to create a context shift at the end of your appointment. Asking for an online review should be the very last thing you do and should only be done when you already know the outcome is going to be a five-star review. So as soon as you pick up your total bag, your total bag, your tool bag and walk towards the door, stop, right? You picked up your tool bag, you're walking towards the door, stop, look your customer in the eye and you're going to ask, will you do me a favor? then be quiet and wait. And they will say, sure, what do you need? And the hardest part of this isn't asking the question. It's remembering to ask. You already did all the hard work. So by creating a context shift here, you're gonna take something you did at 100% of your appointments, picking up your tool bag and walking to the door, and you're gonna associate this with asking for an online review. 
So every time you grab your tool bag and start walking to that door, your brain will say, ding, ask for a review. And verbally asking is non-negotiable. You need to do this in person if you want to get results. Now, sure, if your customer isn't there, send them a message, but you have to verbally ask for the review. However, verbally asking isn't enough to pass the easy test. You also need to reinforce this with an email or text and verbally promise your customer that you are going to make this easy for them by sending them a link. And this is really easy to do in Gazelle because you can use one of your saved message templates to point them to a hidden page on your website that has shortcuts to all of your online profiles. For example, Google, Facebook, Yelp, Angie's List, Nextdoor, Thumbtack, Porch, etc. These are all platforms you can use to find new customers. Now, some are better than others, and some like Yelp are very particular about screening and verifying the authenticity of each review. So reference the information we put in your guide about using each of these platforms. And you can make this even easier for your customers by limiting this to only the platforms you are going to use to find new customers. And also remember, reviews are personal, so you should be too. You've made it easy for them, but you also need to plan to respond to all reviews. The first step to writing a great response is to know what not to say. And right out of the gate, we're going to take away all of the shallow, generic words that lose their meaning when they're overused, right? So in your response, don't say things like, it was nice meeting you. Thank you for your review. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. I appreciate you taking the time. You're too kind. Your review is greatly appreciated. And, and words like amazing or wow. And thank you for your business. But most of all, we're going to take away two words you're going to find yourself naturally trying to slip into every response. Your piano. So we're not going to say things like, it was nice working on your piano. Your piano sounds so much better or anything close to this. Now you can use these words if you want, but they'll water down the effectiveness of your reviews because you're just repeating the same thing over and over again. And it's not personal, which probably has you asking, well, if I can't say any of this, what, what can I say? Well, here's an example. Jane, our time today was the highlight of my day. Your family is a great example of how music can become a lifelong experience. Thank you for sharing the story of how your parents sacrificed to give you music lessons and how you aspire to do the same for your kids. Now, notice this. Because we referenced something that was true and something that only happened at this appointment, it is going to be nearly impossible for the average person to pick up on the fact that behind the scenes, we actually used a pattern to write this response. And you can do the same thing. Using this pattern will make your responses less repetitive, easier to write, and more authentic. And when you reference your downloadable guide, you will find over a dozen examples of ways you can apply this pattern to different types of online reviews. But when you understand the framework of how to respond like this, you will quickly become a pro at writing great responses. So here's the framework. First, say something like, I enjoyed this about our time together. And this should not be about their piano because we are not using words like your piano. Instead, just say, I enjoyed this about our time together. And every interaction you have with your customer is meaningful. And more than that, uh, you're going to end up being in a situation where you love your customer, right? Our customers are great people. So this really isn't that hard. It's probably one of the easiest things to come up with. And it just requires you to say to yourself, okay, so every time I respond, I'm going to say, hey, I enjoyed this about our time together. Uh, so I should probably be more intentional with my conversation and get to know the customer a little. And odds are you're already doing this. We're just being a little more intentional with our small talk and our getting to know the customer. 
and we are just going to take this to the next level. Next is speaking to their aspirational identity. This is the reason that they own the piano, service the piano, and the reason that they told you they want their piano to play better. Whether you realize it or not, customers tell you this all the time. And when you learn to hear it and you're listening for it, you'll easily pick up on it. It could be that their kids are taking lessons or that this is a family heirloom to them or because they themselves are a musician. Whatever it is, if you ask them to tell you about the piano, they'll tell you this aspirational identity without realizing it. And you'll be able to, to hear it if you start listening for it. And lastly, thank them but not for giving you a review or for generically giving you their business. Thank them for something meaningful. In our example, we thanked them for sharing a story with us. And again, you can reference your guide to find ways you can creatively say the same things and similar things over and over again without being repetitive. The most important thing to remember is that you have to make this process easy for you and your customer. And you need to be intentional about this because otherwise the quality and the quantity of future reviews will go down. If you remember nothing else, remember this, you need to make it easy for everyone. And that includes yourself. All right. On to step three, great online reviews create better customers with less effort. The more effort of swinging for the five-star review raises your overall level of service and satisfaction in your job. And as a result, you make good customers better and you make managing difficult customers easier because it causes all customers to become better. Something happens in the customer relationship when you aim for the review and they personally commit to saying nice things about you. Part of what is going on is that great customers make the transition from being just any old customer to being your customer. The act of writing a review helps them verbalize this transformation they experienced from someone who didn't know how to care for their piano to someone who chooses to invest in their piano. And by doing this, your customer also made an even more meaningful transformation by going from someone who was unable to help others to someone who is going to help guide lots of people to a better piano through their online review. Remember you asked, can you do me a favor? They helped you. And for them, this is incredibly rewarding and is one of the primary reasons people love giving reviews. And what is great about this is your best customers are going to tell your story using their own words. None of this is actually about you. It's about your customers helping other people just like them discover something of value. And when you get those kinds of reviews, your customers don't shut up. They write paragraphs of glowing text talking about how you improved so many different aspects of their life. And they're so genuine people don't even question their authenticity, which adds even more credibility to your company. Now, okay, inevitably, you're going to have to deal with an upset customer. So let's ask the question, what do I do about upset customers, especially if they leave me a bad review? Well, first, very few upset customers jump straight to a bad online review. Usually this is a last resort when they feel like you really screwed up or significantly under delivered on your promises. And George, the irony here is that when you're swinging for the five star review, you improve your overall customer satisfaction so much that this becomes even less of an issue, but it can still be an issue. So what do you do? Well, Bad reviews typically fall into three categories. First, disappointed customers who genuinely felt like you overpromised what you delivered. And in my experience, most of the time, they're right. 
or their expectations are so unrealistic, it's better to make a genuine good faith effort to try to disarm the situation and resolve their issue. And if you can't, then it's time to refund their money and fire the customer. You don't want to get into an online mudslinging contest with these people. For whatever reason, you failed to deliver something they expected. Now, if you're going to try to resolve their issue, the best way to disarm the situation is by saying, I'm sorry, XYZ happened. Uh, whatever you need, the answer is yes. How can I help you? And because this is happening in an online forum, I would respond both publicly and privately to this client. We first heard this phrase attending a class taught by Stephen Hopp at a Piano Technicians Guild conference in Texas. And the amazing thing is, when you approach it this way, the customer hardly ever wants a refund. The last time I used an approach like this, I resolved the issue, didn't have to give them a refund. And the customer edited their bad review and turned it into a five-star review. This is an effective method because many upset customers start out wanting the issue resolved more than they want a refund. And they're usually asking for some other kind of accommodation or callback. And the cost of this courtesy call is almost always going to be less than the long-term cost of a negative online review. So whatever you need, the answer is yes. Now, how can I help you? The second kind of negative review is actually a mistake. It's a pissed off customer from a competitor and they accidentally blow up the wrong profile, right? This usually is resolved by saying, um, we would love to resolve this for you, but we can't find any record of you or your contact info in our database. Can you please send us a copy of your invoice number or appointment confirmation email? What you're quietly saying between the lines is, I am organized and I have systems in place to help me provide great customer service. So why aren't you in my system? Sadly, there is a high probability you will never hear from this person again, right? The important thing is that everyone who sees this review will also see that you care and you're organized and they'll probably write that review off or assume the issue was handled off screen. And while you can try to flag this review for removal, this isn't always possible. The final type of negative review is the hardest to deal with. And it is a malicious competitor who is pissed off at the world and thinks sling and mud your way will improve their image. And sadly, yes, we have had to coach people through this situation. And thankfully, with a great response, you can easily turn this situation around. Now, you usually start by responding the same way you would respond to an unknown customer because they're probably using a fake account, not their real account. And right away, you know that this isn't somebody you've ever done business with because they are not in your system. And when you give a solid response, like we just showed you a moment ago, and they realize that you can't be baited into slinging mud, it backfires because they actually don't have what you asked for. They don't have that reasonable thing you asked for. And now they're caught a little flat-footed, like, well, I hope the bad review actually does damage, but I can't get them all riled up. And then they usually go away. Um, but anyway, so this is one of the best ways to handle this. And then typically from there, it's gonna go a couple of different directions. Uh, that are usually easier to handle than the initial negative review. Now, you might be asking, can I remove fake reviews? And it's a fair question. And the answer is usually no. Google and all the other companies, they usually have a policy that says, sorry, deal with it. Um, there is a way to flag the review, usually, and a process of working with the company to remove it but this doesn't guarantee the bad review will come down unless it meets very specific criteria. The only thing you have complete control over is your public response and your ability to bury it in an avalanche of positive five-star reviews. Now, we hope you don't have to deal with it, but if you do, 
turning a negative online review into a positive selling point for your business will probably be a highlight of your career. It gives you more credibility and it shows everyone else that you care. But if you never pursue great reviews because you fear the occasional negative review, well, you're missing out on great reviews and this will damage your business more than you can imagine. Failure on this front means letting a vocal minority or a malicious competitor define your business. Nobody should be defined by their worst reviews or worst service calls. They happen. They shouldn't happen often, but when they do and you respond to them with dignity, nobody deserves to be defined by them. But if you don't have a ton of great reviews to drown them out, they can damage your reputation and repel new customers. But following these steps will help you stockpile tons of great online reviews. Because when you hit a home run, you've earned the cheers of the crowd. Building great reviews doesn't happen by accident. And when it happens, it's important to recognize the success you have achieved. And great reviews do more than make you feel good. They reduce your marketing costs by making paid ads more effective. And in some situations, they can repl completely replace paid ads. They create stronger relationships by helping clients transition from being just any old customer to being your customer. They create more loyalty because when someone gives you an online review, they're more likely to stick with your business over the long haul. And they add value to your brand by helping you grow and eventually sell your business towards the end of your career. A business that comes with hundreds of positive online reviews is instantly going to be more valuable than a business that only has two online reviews. And online reviews create more separation between your personal life and your business because your new customers are no longer being generated by the word of mouth of people you know and friends of people you've done business with. You already did all the hard work, so don't walk out of there without asking. Be intentional and remember to ask for the review and let your best customers tell your story. You can easily go from someone struggling with why you weren't getting great reviews to someone who is intentionally and confidently landing five-star reviews and attracting better customers, all because your best customers are telling your story. So uh, while we transition to Q&A and Nathan sorts through the questions, um, here's a list of upcoming webinars that are coming soon. You can visit growwithgazelle.com backslash school to listen to previous webinars or sign up for future ones. And we'll be covering every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. The team at Gazelle is excited to help you find the tools you need to save your time and wow your customers so you can focus on growing your business and doing what you enjoy most. All right. Thank you, guys. That was very good. Um, so we have had a few questions come in. Um, throughout here and uh, folks feel free to go ahead and click the Q&A button there and and uh, add additional questions uh, while we're going through these that have come in so um, let's start off uh, we'll just take them in order here so um, the first one um, guys is how many reviews is enough I have 10 but my competitors have zero that's a great question um, I'll grab this one Tim um, Absolutely. Having 10 reviews is great. It's absolutely great. But one of the things that people are always looking for as well is when was your last review? So I think you actually are possibly asking the wrong question. Yeah, people absolutely will check to see how many reviews you have, like we said, but they're also going to know when was your last review. So if your last review was three years ago, you're out of date uh, and 10 is not enough. So I would say definitely have more than your competition, um, but also make sure you're staying up to date. Yeah. Tim, you have anything out yeah, I'll add something here. Um, I had f over 400 online reviews on one platform uh, when my other competitors had five, 10, things like that. Um, and I got really comfortable with that number. And then Google started doing their reviews. And so I pivoted over to Google and started building a lot of Google reviews. And I built up like 100, over 100 online reviews on Google when everybody else had zero, one. I think the most was two. And I got really comfortable there. Um, in a year, a new competitor came up. They took a look at the landscape and they took one look at me and they said, holy cow, 
if I am going to compete with this company, I have to have more reviews than them. And in 12 months, they surpassed me. And I was actually, you know, there's a little more to the story about how they did it, uh, but I, I was actually watching it happen. And the reality was they were getting more new customers than I was because I had a very established clientele who had already reviewed me. So I'm like uh, watching this happen going, okay, I got to like build up on this. I got to build up on this. And I'm going to each appointment, right? That person already gave me a great review and I could ask for an updated review. That person gave me a review. So I just couldn't get enough new reviews going. And like George said, I was aware of the whole, like you want fresh reviews going. And I actually couldn't keep up. And they, you know, so now I'm the number two reviewed in my area. And I've learned that there's actually a lot of benefit to being both the most reviewed and the second most reviewed. The important thing is um, 10 to zero is about the same as 50 to zero. 100 to zero is like this big wow statement. Uh, but when somebody wants to compete with 100 and have the same effect I had at 100 to zero, they really need probably 500. And so in a lot of ways, even though there's now this big gap between us, um, people treat us the same because we're the only companies in the area that have hundreds of reviews. And so uh, in a lot of ways, it's not the quantity, it's the quality of the reviews, it's the timestamp on how recent were the reviews, and one of my pride points is when you go and you read our reviews, we have paragraphs of text. And our, a lot of the competitors' reviews are just like one line, he tuned the piano, it sounds good. And then there's, you know, a one line response or something, you know, thanks for your business. And so I'm much more confident in my ability to compete with fewer reviews. Uh, so it's just not a numbers game for me, but you do need a lot of them and you need the ability to stack a lot of them. Great question though. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Okay, so the next question is kind of ethics related, um, maybe a little bit. It's uh, the question is, is it fair to ask my clients to help with my marketing? That's a good question. A good I'll, question. Jump, I'll jump on this and uh, George, I want to hear your response to this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going to jump out the gate and say absolutely it's fair, um, but you got to really start thinking through how you are going about asking for the review and what you're setting up. So it's into those, it's in the promise and fulfillment of your business. So if your promises are, hey, listen, I've got 105 ways I'm going to make doing business with me really easy and you're going to absolutely love it. And I promise if you give me an online review, you're going to feel great because you've helped a lot of people discover something special. I'm actually giving you something. Now, there's another way to ask for online reviews where I just prance in and I do my job. And then I look at you and I'm like, well, I did my job. How about you give me an online review? I mean, it's it, obviously nobody would ever say it that way, but it's all in the way you set it up, in the way you execute it. Uh, it is either going to be, I think the negative part of that question is it kind of feels slimy to have other people do your marketing. Well, yeah, there's a way you could do it where that's the outcome. And I don't want that because your reviews are going to be short to the point, like, oh, I really didn't want to give this guy a review, but all right, here it is. And I'm just not going to put my heart into it. Or you could set it up so that people absolutely love so many points of doing business with you. And they love the idea of helping people find you that they come at the review from a completely different place. Those are the reviews I'm talking about. Those are the reviews I want. Yeah, Tim, um, the only thing I would add to that is this idea that if you take a moment and reflect in your life, what are the businesses that if they asked, you would in a heartbeat be a word of mouth for them, yeah. right? These are the ones you value. These are the, the people that even though um, they're, they're those, those business friends that when you interact with them and go into their business, you feel like you're not just getting the product that they're selling you or the service that they're selling you, but there's something else. There's a relationship you feel. You might feel that with your mechanic. You might even feel with your dentist. I don't know. There's something, there are businesses you will feel that with. What yes. you're aiming for is to be that to your customers. And when you deliver that to your customers, you're not asking them to help with your marketing. You're giving them an outlet for something they're already doing. They've already been talking about you because you're that good to them. And that relationship exists. And you're making it easy for them to tell others about you. Again, um, Marketing to many people is a dirty word, especially when you're running a business that you're trying to make feel personal. And what you're doing is you're taking the dirty word out and you're replacing it with uh, 
giving people an opportunity to share your story. Um, and sure, it'll be used for marketing, but it's, it's not in the sense that some people view that word. Yeah. And George, one other thing, your response made me think of this. I am actually sitting on a business I absolutely love doing business with. All right. It's that relationship. And they asked me to give them a Google review recently. I haven't done it yet. And the reason is I could have spent five minutes giving them an online review, which would have been okay. But I know that I want to do this business justice because they absolutely knocked it out of the park for me. And my life has improved dramatically because of the relationship I have with them. And so I am sitting on this. And my biggest question right now is, man, I really want to do this, but I got to carve out, like, I feel like I need 30 to 40 minutes to draft the review, look over the review, and then sleep on the review and come back to it the next day before I post it. Because I want this review for this business to just be knock out of the park and send a lot of people their way. And I you know, looking at the businesses I review and when they knock it out of the park, that's the emotion I feel. When they don't, I often will be like, I'll, I'll think about giving you a review and then I never get around to it. Or it's this five minute quick blurt and you move on. Great answers guys. Okay. So uh, the next question um, is uh, that I think several people are wondering here, but uh, it, they're wondering about the necessity of doing reviews on multiple platforms. Is it necessary to get reviews mm -hmm. on forum on multiple forums like Facebook, Nextdoor, etc.? Reviews are like uh, newspapers, right? When I mean, you're going to think about who's the reach on this particular newspaper or this particular ad location, right? Who am I reaching? So I would say the same thing with the different review locations. Who's the audience that this is going to reach? So if you're going for a new customer group. Perhaps you've got a solid following on Google, you know, and you've, Google reviews have been doing great for you, and you've decided you're going to spread out into a new area. You don't need to do all of these all at the same time, but you should definitely have at least one. Um, and then when you're thinking about expanding your business, you might reach to others when you feel – like, like Tim said in his story, I felt comfortable in that area of reviews, so I moved on to another platform. Do you have something to add to that, Tim? Yeah. Um, you definitely want – reviews on multiple platforms. Absolutely. Uh, and also in the downloaded guide that we gave you, we actually unpacked a lot more information about all the different platforms you can do and some pros and cons of working with them. So there's a lot more information you can go reference there. Um, so you do want reviews on multiple platforms uh, for no other reason that people who care actually do research and they are probably a part of these platforms and, you know, it's almost like um, word of mouth. When you get a customer who is word of mouth and just one friend told them, uh, it's good, right? You've got the sale. I can't tell you how many, I don't know what community I got into in word of mouth, but there are multiple times a year that I would have a customer tell me like, I went and asked people who I should use and like six different people said, absolutely use this guy. And after the fourth time, I thought, I should probably use this guy, right? And so uh, it's the same with online reviews. So if they're gonna go, they're, they're gonna start with Google, right? Google's the king here. So if you don't have reviews, start with Google, period, end of story. Focus all of your firepower on Google. And I would simply give yourself a 10X rule. You wanna have at least 10X, at least 50 reviews. So the other question earlier about I've got 10, everybody else has zero, go for 50. And then go for 100. Don't stop on Google till you have more than 100 reviews. And then if nobody is chasing you, then you can consider looking at these other platforms and considering. Uh, and so a lot of it is how much time do you want to invest in the platform? Uh, when I started, you had word of mouth. And then Google came out with this idea. And before Google, there was Angie's List. And Angie's List was a print a publication that was an online user base review platform. They're now digital. Um, and so there were just two. And then there was Google. And now there's like 100. And actually, funny, in doing the research for this, I was aware of the Angie's List of Google, the Facebook, the Porch, the Thumbtack, all these others. And do you know that I've been getting hit with Google ads for review, user experience review platforms I had no clue existed. And, and there's so much competition in this space. 
And I look at it like, I don't even know how many customers of yours are actually customers of mine. And so we're at a spot with online reviews where you definitely need Google, but now you just need to be critical about the other platforms you're gonna waste time on. Did I say waste time on? It's possible you will. Spend time on. Uh, and you just need to look at the cost benefit because there is an effort that goes into this and every review you get on another platform is one review taken away from Google unless you put all of your list up on your hidden page on your website with everybody and you're like, hey, I'm not going to complain if you're happy and you're going to cross post the same review everywhere. That's great. But if somebody's going to pick, I want Google. So that's how I think about it. Great. Okay, so we have had two questions come in about um, how to move reviews. So uh, I'll just read the first one here. So, uh, but they're essentially the, the exact same question. Um, I'm planning to relocate my business to a different state next year. I've gotten over 40 online reviews so far. Is there a way to transfer my reviews after my move or will they disappear? And the other, yeah, the other question is the same. So I'll just. Yeah, yeah. carefully and slowly do not click a button if you do not know the outcome. That's step one. Step two, can you actually post in the comment or the chat, are you talking about Google reviews or are you talking about other platforms? That's gonna matter. Uh, so I'll answer that question when it comes in. Um, and then second, all of these companies have already dealt with this situation, okay? Google's dealt with companies that have moved, relocated, and all these other things. They all have policies, and they are buried in their policies and procedures and their help centers. So you need to do a lot of research. You need to call the company. You need to get somebody on the phone. You need to talk to them. You need to say, listen, here's the deal. My business, because think about it. It doesn't matter if you're relocating across the country or down the street. Think of the yoga studio that has a thousand reviews, and they relocate five miles away. They want those thousand reviews to stay. So the, the review companies are already dealing with this. There's a policy, there's a procedure, but you need to be very, very, very careful because I know that some of these platforms have really strict rules on this and even strict rules about changes of management. So sometimes you end up like hitting up against this, is the management changing problem? And so you just have to be very familiar with what their policies are. The last thing you want to have happen is for you to make a move thinking one thing would happen and have the opposite happen and lose everything because now you're back to square one. And so you just have to be very careful. So uh, let me jump in real quick, uh, George, before you add a thought. Uh, we had both folks responded and they were both mostly thinking about Google, but possibly other okay. platforms as well. Yeah. Um, I have transferred, so Google is managed by your Google My Business profile. And inside your Google My Business profile is the name of the business, all the reviews you're managing, uh, the address of the business, the phone number of the business, all the contact info for the business. Check with Google to make sure they haven't changed their policy, uh, but usually it's as simple as changing the address of your business to a different location and going through an address verification process. And what ends up happening is if you change your address, then they're going to verify it, then they verified it, then it starts showing up and it works through their system. But you want to check their help centers because Google changes their policies like every five minutes. And I just put in the chat a support, the support page for Google uh, for help for moving reviews. Um, and again, I can't yeah, help yeah. you with other, other places, uh, but I'm sure they have pages like this or just get, yeah. get online with their support. Yeah, and I would, I would just double check the list twice, dot your I's, cross your T's. That's sure. one area that I would just treat like the uh, sacred element of your company. So, yeah. Great. because wow, if you have a lot of reviews and you move across country and you can transfer those or you move across this to yeah. a different city, holy moly, like that's, cold. that's just unfair. That's cold almost. It's like, all right, um, yeah, at that point, uh, that's, uh, that, that, I never even thought about that. <laughs> uh, I think I would have been just been like really sad if I thought I was a review leader and somebody just moved into the area and brought 5X reviews. I would just be like, shoot, I should have worked harder to build more reviews. You know, 20X wasn't enough. That's probably how I would have felt. <laughs> but do it if that's you. Absolutely. 
Okay, so the next question um, is uh, kind of a change in focus of the business itself. So uh, the question reads, oh, my business yeah. is slowly turning from a personal tuning and maintenance service to a company that sends other technicians to the customer's house to do the job. How can I keep the personal contact with the customers as it was when I was just myself going mm -hmm. around tuning? Yeah, so step one, you need to buy everybody dinner sit them all down and watch this webinar. And you need to look at all of your people and you say, listen, here's the standard. This is what I expect all of us to be doing because this is a team of people. We are in this together and we need to be working together. And so this is how I've done it or this is how I want to do it. Here's some other things that I've learned along the way. Um, if you're using Gazelle, uh, here are the templates in Gazelle every time you complete an appointment. If you've asked for the review and they've agreed to give it, send them this message. You need to be very, very specific with what you expect of your team and how you are going to um, measure their success. So that's kind of step one, get everybody on the same page. Then you need to look at the words of all your messaging. So earlier we talked about what is that promise and fulfillment cycle? Your business probably was promising I, me, I will do this and then I will do this. You need to go back and make sure you're consistent with we will do this and we will do this. And uh, so start to actually think through that. You need to look at your website. You need to look at your automated uh, reminders that are going out. And then you need to look at the email going out to um, ask for the review to link to your web page. And then on your web page, it would be helpful to have a team picture. Like, hey, here's the people building and running this business, right? And so now there's this team element where if you do it right, you don't want um, John's piano service to have like a bunch of John is great reviews who John then hires Samantha and uh, now the reviews are either John is great or Samantha is great. That's actually a failure. You don't want that. What you want to see is that the reviews go from John is great to John and his team is great. And that slowly morphs into, you know, and it might sound like John and his team and Samantha are really great. And that just morphs into this team of people is really awesome. And that's going to take some time, but that's kind of the transition you want to see happen. Uh, if what happens is you keep everything very, very, very personal, then you end up with a lot of reviews like John is great and Samantha is great. And then people reading the reviews are really unhappy when eventually Taylor shows up. And they're like, who's this Taylor guy? I read a lot of reviews about John and Samantha. Um, and so I was okay with them, but now this Taylor guy shows up and now I lost all trust or at least lost whatever trust I thought I had. And now I'm starting back at square one. So, um, it's not like a quick switch, but it's just a lot of little details you want to think through. And if you're intentional, you can absolutely make that shift. And then all your old reviews that are, they're not water, it's water under the bridge. They're not wasted because people aren't going to go back five years if you have 50 reviews this year. And so eventually you're just, it's, it's a replacement game with the old reviews that you had because they do become dated. Uh, George, what would you add to that? Tim, I think you, I think you nailed a lot of it. Um, I would add, if, if I woke up in your shoes and I was in the situation you're in right now, the very first thing I would want to do is sit down and write down the values that I have held personally as part of our business mm. and the values that I want to move forward into the business as a whole. So what are the values and what are the vision? And then as Tim said, you're going to train your staff that this is the values that we hold together. And this is, the, this is what it means to work in this company. And this is the, the vision I have when you walk through that door and the values you're going to present during that time. The other thing I would add is um, this is a great time to actually go back to a previous webinar. If you haven't seen it yet, we did a, rev, uh, a webinar called Tripling Your Revenue. And really one of the things we focused on in that webinar was the idea of when you start shifting and growing, your systems have to change. And what I'm hearing in that question is, my business is changing. How do I keep the core of the value I hold while I grow? And what I'm hearing is that you're going to have to retool your systems 
while remaining true to your core. And that webinar, Tripling Your Revenue, really kind of laid out some ways to do that. Yeah. And the only thing I would add, too, is um, there is a balance. It's actually a bit of a tension between earlier, we were talking about how when you knock it out of the park, your customers write this, you know, paragraphs of text, and it's just an authentic review. It's so deeply personal, people don't question the authenticity. There's a tension between the personalness of that and this, um, the vagueness of a team. So you don't want to completely lose the personal nature of that. And so what I would be aiming for is I do want some element and some personal element of Samantha was the person who came out, right? I, it's not a total failure if that's the review, but you do want it to be something in the review that makes the transition from this person is great to these people are great. And it might happen in the first line, it might happen in the final line, but if you're telling your story properly, uh, it's your, your story, it sounds something like, you know, we love what we do. This person is great. This person is great. We are great. And if you put those words in your customer's mouth, as you're telling your story from the reviews that have come to your website, to your automated messages, to the final email asking for the review, and even the, ver the way your technicians talk. If you're doing that, then it's not going to be a surprise when you get reviews that say, this person is great and these people are awesome. And that's really what I would be trying to aim for. Great responses. Okay, so the next question, uh, we've got quite a number of questions uh, that have come in here. So uh, try to get through them here. Uh, so the next question is, do you ask for reviews from the same customer each time? Or how do you track who has reviewed? Yeah, um, I'll, I'm the one who's been out in the field most here. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I do. Um, and it, it is purely a numbers game at that point, And it is purely a frequency and freshness game because Google and all the other platforms love to see companies and they promote companies with the freshest, best reviews. And so I, um, it, we put this in your guide, but there's actually three different emails that I have in my back pocket to send to people. I call the first one a solicited online review where if I talk to the customer and they, you know, I know that I knocked it out of the park and they're saying all the right words, you're amazing, I love it, the piano sounds great. I ask for the review, they say yes, I send them that. And the words there are basically, thank you so much for offering to give me an online review. You know, here's the link. The unsolicited online review message is for when I might have had an email conversation with the client or a phone conversation. I, I didn't directly ask them to give me an online review but I know that I knocked it out of the park. And so I'll send that as a, um, you know, hey, it was great meeting you and working on your piano today. Would you mind giving me an online review? Um, the third template is what I call an updated review request. And I started doing this when I realized I had a problem on the numbers game because I didn't have enough new clients uh, back to back to back to back to quickly accelerate my reviews. So I started asking old customers who maybe reviewed me two years ago to give me an updated review. And it just sounded something like, you know, hey, Sally, you've been with me a long time. You know, we're friends. Would you mind giving me an updated review? Because Google really likes me just to keep fresh reviews. And I haven't quite figured out how to get those updated reviews to be really great reviews. They're five stars and they're usually short. They don't really cover all the bases. They don't tell my story well. It's usually like um, five stars, this company's great. They've been doing this a long time and I really love them. And it's like, yeah, but that didn't ca capture the authentic, the, the, the authentic emotion that happened the first time they sat down at their piano and just said, wow, this is amazing. And that was in their first review. So they don't just copy and paste their original review. So what I learned was when I get updated reviews, the value there is just that there's just another five-star review, but the words in the review usually don't tell my story the way I'd want, or they're not as great of a quality, uh, but they're still good enough for me to not to, to, to pursue it. So I, I would do that that way. Um, I, I'm never going to turn down a five-star review. I would just prefer if the words told the story better. 
Uh, what would you add to that, George? I, I think, Tim, what you talked about right there about the idea that the second and third review from the same customer does not give the same kind of impact. Um, so I would focus more on the, on the first time reviews as best as possible. I think you're also spending time, if you're following this model that we've laid out the framework, you've also thanked them online, right? So you've noticed mm -hmm. that they've done a review and you've actually posted and said, thank you for that review, which means you have the opportunity to make a note in your customer notes that this person yep. gave you a review. Yeah. Um, which also means that on your next visit, you can thank them again verbally face to face because you checked your yep. customer notes before you walked in. Um, yep. So it becomes part of the part of the conversation that you're now having with this customer so that sometimes you may not even have to ask them to update that review. They're reminded that they've have a review out there. Um, but again, everything it really does, as Tim pointed out, first time reviews are going to be your most powerful because they're the most emotional. Second time reviews, they've already, they're no longer helping you in the way they did the first time. Um, so I would focus on first times. Yeah. George, George, you're a consumer. Yeah. You've reviewed companies and you've had companies ask you to give you a review. Mm -hmm. Put your consumer hat on. What would it take from a company for you to do a second review with the same intentionality that you did your first review? They'd have to have solved a major problem. It would have to be an out of the park. So, so if, if you have somebody who you did a tuning for, and then you and then you came back to them and you did a rebuild, that's worth a second review. Uh, yep. Yeah. So or if it, you did a regulation or voicing that you didn't right. do on the first pass, mm -hmm. okay. So the framework there being that every time you make a bigger improvement in their life, absolutely, you treat that like a first review. That's right. Um, Something, something I just thought of, uh, eight years ago, I was on a road trip and I stopped by a pizza parlor and I couldn't find it. Um, and I, I searched for 10 minutes cause I'd heard about it. And finally I found it and I took a picture of my phone at the intersection where the sign was wrong. And I put it up on the review on Google. Do you know that eight years later, every month, Google emails me and reminds me that this review sent people my way or sent people their way and helped so many people. Um, and I mean, they're thumbs upping the picture and all this stuff. And so I was just thinking like, what would it take for my, me and my customers? You know, I would treat it like, okay, let's pretend like a new customer gives you a review today. It's about intentionality. Yes. So you have four appointments over the next two years with this person every single appointment, personally thank them for that review. Don't ask them for another one. Just personally thank them. Because honestly, I think if somebody did that with me, I gave them a review and every time they showed up, they said, you know what, Tim, I just want to tell you, your review two years ago, I still am appreciative of it. And I can't tell you how many people you sent my way. Now, you tell me that story every time, and then in year three, you say, hey, you know, I tell you, Google really likes us to keep some updated reviews. Would you mind doing it again? I'm now motivated now because I'm like, oh, shoot, <laughs> my first one was good, but I got to like, I got to top that. So honestly, I haven't applied. I'm going to start applying that because I think that might actually help with the second review problem, um, make them better, more qu higher quality. So, yeah, thanks for making me think of that. There we go. All right, uh, so the next question, when I thank someone for their review, should I do it privately through a message uh, from Gazelle or should I reply publicly on Google or both? Um, I heard two different things there. You said should, when I ask them for a review, should no, when I, I... Sorry, when oh, I... Oh, sorry, when you thank them. I'm yeah, sorry, yes, okay. Yep. Yes, yes, definitely reply publicly on Google. And honestly, I think that's sufficient. I don't, it's going to be a lot of work for you to also then send them an email. Um, I would, I would actually, what we were just talking about, what I would do is I'd reply pu publicly on Google. And then the next time you service their piano, mention it to them um, and just say, oh yeah, thank you. So put a note on your file, on their file in Gazelle and make sure you bring it up the next time. And Tim, you've got a good story about why you want to respond publicly to the, to the positive reviews. Um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to, to lead you here to your own story. Um, but the idea that if you only respond to the negative reviews. Oh, I remember what we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Um, it was a couple of years ago. 
Um, I got a bad review. And it was one of these situations where, you know, we dropped the ball. It was merited, okay? We dropped the ball. We didn't show up for an appointment on time. It really wrecked his day, you know, all that, all that stuff. All the stuff you don't want in an online review, we did it, okay? And so we were in damage control mode. We were trying to make this client happy. We ended up actually getting the review changed because we made him really happy. That was one of our success stories there. Um, but the guy was really ticked. And so I had not uh, built in a habit, and actually I still haven't built in the habit of responding to every review the way that I want. This is one of those improvements in my business I'm working on. But uh, I had not responded to a lot of reviews. He gives me a negative review. And of course I see it come through Google and I'm jumping straight on there. Like five minutes later, I give a response. And do you know what he responded with? Well, it looks like I know how to get your attention. You don't respond to any other reviews except a negative review. And I thought, oh, Lord, like this is not the narrative I want for my business. This isn't who we are. But you know what? You got a point. And so in responding to the reviews, it's less about the customer and more about the people who are both reading the review and reading your response and asking that question George mentioned earlier. Could this be me? Could this be my experience? And if I gave a review and they responded that way, would I feel good? Right. That's where the decision point is. That's where the value is here. Um, and yes, there is value in the client also getting notified by Google or whatever platform that so-and-so responded to your review. Thank you. Uh, but I would put that as tertiary possibly on the value spectrum. Great. Okay. So uh, what should I do if I forget to ask for a review at the appointment? Uh that's what the unsolicited online review template is for. I can't tell you how many times I picked up my tool bag, walked out, I hear the door click behind me and I'm like, oh man, like 30 seconds ago, I was on the tip of my tongue, ask for the review, ask for the review, I didn't ask for the review. Uh, and so that's why I created that template because then I just, okay, don't worry about it. And I just send them the email right then and there. And uh, it's, it's just a verbiage change. One email starts off with, thank you for offering to give me a review. The other email starts off with, hey, would you mind considering? Um, and so that's why I have that template. Great. Uh, how might you use the response to the review for a second or third review? Uh, sorry, let me, let me start that again. How might do you use the response to a second or third review to make the review more personal, specific, or thorough? Yeah. I'll jump in here because I... I think you'll have something to make this better, George, but um, the, you got to think of what the value is here. So I have a couple of frameworks here. One framework I use is my response should never be longer than their review, which is really difficult if they only say a few words. That's the only time I respond with just, thank you so much. It was really great meeting you because I'm trying to make my response mirror theirs. Otherwise it feels a little off balance. Like, hold on. They said, two words and then you replied with two paragraphs. What's that about? That's a little weird. Um, so if you can't succeed in getting the second review long enough, you're going to have a little bit of a word problem here. But if you can solve that and they give a really thorough, great online review the second time around, I would look at the value here as being able to point to a relationship that has been so long standing that people read the response and go, oh my goodness, this is not only a company people love, it is a company they stick with for a decade. There's something to be said about that. And a decade later, the business owner is still such good friends with this person that they would take the time to write that response. That's, I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know if there's a bigger value. I'm trying to figure out if there is a bigger value in that situation than that kind of an emotional grab. Um, what, what are your thoughts, George? Well, Tim, I think two minutes ago, you highlighted the idea that the reviews are two different things. They're both a conversation between you and your customer, and mm -hmm. they're a written document for a third party to read and see and understand yeah. your company. So what you just described right there, the idea that, so a customer gives a review, you've given a response. They come back three years later, they give another review, you give another response. If you think about it from how the outside viewer is seeing this, like you just said, you have an opportunity to say things like, you know, um, 
having been invited into your home for the last three years, having been invited into your home for the last five years, I have found that blah, blah, this blah. This is true. Yeah, right? yeah. And so what you begin is now you're telling a story. Again, it's all about what story is being told about your business yes. and about you. And what is the reader getting out of it as well as what is the customer getting out of it? So if yeah. you want to tell that story that we – have customers who are loyal we are loyal to our customers we grow relationships this is a great opportunity to do that yeah yeah that's great we grow relationships is the story write that yeah. down <laughs> yep. okay is there a way to automatically have gazelle send all my clients a please give us an online review email after each appointment no and that is intentional because you don't want that uh, you want to only ask for the review when you knock it out of the park and you know, there's a story about lawyers. You never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. You never ask it for a review if you don't already know it's going to be five stars or something great. Uh, and so if you were to set up a situation where 100% of your appointments uh, are going to get asked for a review, and just imagine the situation where your day has gone so sideways, you can't even think about it. You're distracted. You walk out of there and all of a sudden, you know that you bombed that appointment and now it comes for the review and that email goes out and then boom, here's a two star review saying, man, they really screwed up today. I wasn't so unhappy. I asked for a review, but I'm probably never going to do business with them again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. That's going to happen unless you're perfect and you got a perfect batting record. Nobody has that. <laughs> so do yourself a favor, protect yourself. Don't automate this part of it. This is something that needs to be personal. You send it as a follow-up on the verbal ask or when you already know that the review is going to be good. Right on. Okay. I've got a question about your recommendation earlier that we should promise the client that we will arrive on time. How do I consistently do this and not get into trouble when my day goes sideways? Yeah. Um, promise and fulfillment is so huge here. Um, you really, it, it, you have to be intentional here. Uh, I solve this by simply saying, I, you, you, you have to be very careful what you promise. So you only promise what you can deliver. I don't promise I'm going to arrive all on time come hell or high water. I promise I will arrive on time. And if I'm running late, I will call. That is my promise. Arrive on time. If I'm late, I call. Yep. And I am swinging for the five-star review. So it's a time management problem. So all, all morning as I'm hitting a new client, let's say that I hit a client that I know is going to set me an hour late. I don't want to be an hour late. I want to, I'm okay being five minutes late. I'm, un-okay being 10 minutes late. And I'm really not okay being 15 minutes late. I would prefer to call somebody at 10 o'clock for a 10 o'clock appointment and tell them I'm two minutes away. And I do that all the time. And it shows up in reviews all the time. But what happened earlier that nobody knows about was I told a client who was new, who had extra stuff I wasn't prepared for, you booked a two-hour appointment and this is five hours of work or you booked a two hour appointment, this is two and a half hours of work. Before I can guarantee I can do the work today, I need to go call my other two clients and see if I can bump everybody back 30 minutes. That happened on appointment number one, because in my head, I was making it a priority to be on time at the end of the day. And when I started doing that, and I started going back to client number one and saying, you know what, I would really love to, we need to reschedule all of this work. I will do two hours today and I'll swing in next week on Tuesday because I'm in the area and I, I'll finish up the 30 minutes because my third appointment today has a doctor's appointment she has to get to. And they go, okay, great. There was actually no business lost and my stress went down <laughs> because I used to not manage my time well. Uh, so as the technician who's been in the homes doing it and running it, that's how I've solved that problem. George, is there stuff you would add to that? Yeah, um, I've, I've actually run uh, two or three businesses where time being on time mattered. Um, and so the policy always was, this is the time that you're scheduled. Um, we we plan on being there. Just like Tim said, we, we plan on being there at this time. If we are uh, see we are going to be late, we will, we will call so that you know. And honestly, people understand that. Um, 
they understand that incredibly well. And then the people on the road, you always need to make sure don't test that. If your tech is on the road and it's not you on the road, but you've got somebody on the road instead, if you know you're going to be late, call as soon as you know. Don't yes. wait to 10 o'clock to tell them at 10 o'clock. If you know you're going to be late at 930, call them at 930. Yeah. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll just plug Gazelle here and just say the one of the things I've been impressed with Gazelle is it really does wonders on managing your time. So yes. if you have, are not currently using Gazelle, I think it helps you keep your promises um, much better. Yeah. And there's, there's also something to be said here for the arrival window, the traditional cable oh, guy, yeah. I'll be there maybe this week. They eventually shortened it to an eight hour window. I'll be there this day. <laughs> then they shortened it to a four hour window. Then they shortened it to a two hour window and couldn't keep it. So now it's back to a four hour window or something. Um, and a lot of people do arrival windows. And what I found is that that is actually a function of a broken system in the past when you couldn't predict accurately yeah. what your day was. It is also a function of not managing time well. And so if you're not going to manage time well, you need an arrival window. But there's a great story about Boeing and the CNC machines today that can measure something into the nanoseconds of an inch where the CEO of Boeing saw a request come through for a machine that was going to cost $5 million to produce to make wedges. Because every time they put a wing on an airplane, it was just a little bit off and they would solve it by welding in this little wedge. And they wanted to buy a $5 million machine to make better wedges. And he took one look at that and he just said, screw the wedges. Why is the wing not the right size to start with? And that is the beginning of the CNC machine. And I, if I, I might have butchered the manufacturer. I can't remember what the manufacturer was. I think it was Boeing uh, that did that. And it's the same thing with these arrival windows. Screw the arrival window. You don't need it if you use Gazelle because it predicts your day well enough and if you manage your time well. And by doing that, you're going to step above so many other companies and competitors. Uh, you're going to be knocking it out of the park absolutely every day out of the week. So... Okay, so the next question is a timing question. Uh, when I send out the request for an, a review email, should I send it out as soon as I finish the appointment or should I set Gazelle to send it out later with a scheduled message? Send it out in the evening because that's when they're sitting down with their phone, they've climbed into bed and they're browsing their email before the end of the day. And suddenly, pop, there's that email. Oh yeah. I did have that conversation earlier today. And they might just knock it out right there, sitting in bed, on their phone, write the review, call the night, sit on their laptop. Um, but you want to hit it at a time where they have a window to think about this for a brief moment. You want to catch them when they are ready to do it, not necessarily when you were ready to ask them to do it. Tim, you have something to add to that? Yeah, uh, the only time I, I do that same thing. Yeah, absolutely, send it in the evening. Um, if they have kids, Look at the age of the kids. If their kids are young, send it about 7.30. If their kids are older, send it about nine, but not if it's a text message, right? Um, and if they are empty nesters, right? Send it at like 6.30 or something when you know that they're sitting out on the porch with a glass of wine, their first glass of wine. I, it's gonna loosen up the review a little bit, right? Um, you know, so I'm, I'm off, often like shifting that. And sometimes I do send it out right away but usually it's because I've gotten a read on the situation and I know that's the case, but man, there are so many appointments where at the end of the appointment, the mom's like, you know, okay, here's my card. Here's this. Okay, Sally, get in the car. We got to run. And I'm packing my, t I, I shut the door. They're out of the driveway before I'm gone. And the garage door goes down and I'm like, I'm not sending that email right now. And uh, send it as a text message. It, that's really great uh, in the evening as well. Like somewhere around seven 30, I personally wouldn't schedule it to go out later than maybe eight. Um, but anyway, so yeah, absolutely. Great. Good, good question. Um, okay, so earlier in the, in the uh, presentation, you guys talked about that it can be difficult to get a review removed from some of these online platforms. Um, so how bad does a review need to be in order to consider trying to get it removed? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, go, go go for it, George. Um, 
if it's a one or two star review, it's doing two things. One, it's lowering your average. So if you have 10 reviews and you've got one that is a one star, then you've got a 4.5 star review out of 10. So the reason why I'm saying pointing this out is because it's not really a question of how bad are the words. The very first thing that's going to happen is going to take down your average. Um, second, if it's on your first page of reviews, um, there was actually an article that just came out in the Harvard Business Review just this past month uh, talking about how a, a bad review on the very first page of your reviews uh, lowers the likelihood of somebody doing business with you by 51%. And the best thing you can do is get it off that first page. And that's either by, like we said, avalanching it, and burying it, or having it removed. Um, so I would say, how bad does it have to be? Every one to two star review should be, have something. You, you need to deal with it, whether that's avalanche it, bury it, or have it removed. But again, having it removed is really hard. And it's not a matter of how bad the words are that will get it removed. You're only going to get it removed if it's a false, malicious attack, or if it's not your business, not, not for your business. And even then, you're going to have to be able to prove those things. Tim, do you have anything you have? Yeah, um, I would. I would not, by default, try to get mediocre reviews removed. Because even in your response, people are going to see that you care. And it when you handle it right, if yes. they just give you the review and you don't say anything, man, that's bad. That's bad news for you. Mm -hmm. But if they give you the review and then you handle it well, that becomes the selling point because now the, the customers are going to go, okay, this company might have five stars. This company has 4.8. Where is that review? I'm mm -hmm. not stopping until I find it. I'll go straight 100%. to the two-star review. I'll read the comment. I'll put myself in their shoes and go, Hey, that's a reasonable comment. These feel authentic. Hey, what's going on with Mr. Five Stars up there? Did he pay for some of those reviews? Uh, and so I'm, I'm all, my brain is operating so fast. I can't even keep up with it. So mm -hmm. in some cases, a, a well-responded negative review is better than the five star. But like George said, if it's a one star, if it's false, if it's malicious, if people are just blowing you up for no good reason, if the narrative is false, um, or if it was a competitor or something like that, absolutely go through the process. It's going to be worth your time. And if it's on page one, it's probably going to take you less time to bury it than it will working through the bureaucracy of whatever platform you're on of getting it removed. You know, it might be six months before you get it removed. So just bury it with tons of five-star reviews. And you talk about those second reviews from customers. If you got some loyal customers, if it's bad enough, I would get on the phone. And I would call some of my best customers and just be like, listen, here's the I tuned you two weeks ago. Uh, I just got a really bad review. Could you help me? Right? If it was bad enough, I would do something like that and just try to get some positive reviews going. But absolutely every person tomorrow, I'm trying to, if I have three appointments, I want three reviews. And the next day, if I have three appointments, I want three more reviews. I'm just going to bury it. And I'm going to work extra hard to make sure that happens as quickly as possible. So. Yeah, I just want to highlight something you just said there. Um, the idea of having a 4.8 or a 4.9, it's actually, there's a name for it. It's called the Persian rug effect. And the idea is that when Persian rugs were handmade, there was a flaw intentionally put into that rug. Hmm. And that's how you knew it was authentic. Right? Interesting. When I see a business that has 200 five-star reviews, my first thought is there's something wrong here. That's impossible. Either they got rid of all their, all their negative reviews or I quickly see that they must have dumped their previous – this happens on Amazon all the time, right? They dumped their free, oh, yeah. previous business, and now they've got 10 five-stars, and the minute they start getting bad reviews, they dump that one and create a new business. Um, so I, I actually look for a flaw. I want to see one or two, and yeah. I want to see that you responded to it well because if I was in those people's shoes, there's hope for redemption yep. Yeah. The, the one place that where this is going to be really interesting is fast forward 10 years, okay? Many people are going to be retiring or selling their business in 10, 15, or 20 years. Imagine the situation 10 years from now, though, where a thousand reviews is the minimum threshold because people have been doing 100 reviews a year for 10 years. That is not the case where you want to be dumping reviews. And if everybody, if one person had 800, one had 1,000, one had 1,200, and they're all five stars, it, it waters down that effect because everybody already has it, right? And so this is an area where as soon as you start piling up reviews, 
everybody in your area goes, hold on, what's going on? They might not know how you're doing it, but they're going to start getting more reviews. It has this effect of, and like I said, when a new person came in, boom, all of a sudden they went and got a ton of reviews. And it made me look more authentic because I, before they existed, I would have new clients call in and go, I saw you had hundreds of reviews. Nobody else had any. I was wondering, are those real? They would ask me that. And then they, before I would answer, they would say, but then I read all the reviews and they sounded so authentic. I just couldn't argue with it. So just tell me they're real and I'll book the appointment. Once they came up and we were like, had hundreds of reviews together, people just said, oh, well, I guess hundreds of reviews is the norm. So they don't even ask that question anymore. And that's one area where they actually did me a favor by coming up and getting a ton of reviews because now people just call me up and they go, yeah, yeah, let's do business. I like your reviews. And that's, I mean, it's just easier. So there's a couple of different parts of that that I've experienced, but yeah, absolutely. The Persian rug, rug effect is good, so. Okay, so we have two remaining questions and one um, kind of side question. So the side question here uh, from someone anonymous was, Tim, will you please leave me a review? Uh, <laughs> uh, how much are you going to pay me? And no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so the second to last question uh, is, how should I respond to mediocre two and three star reviews? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, if you follow the guide, it says, I really enjoyed this about our time together. You don't want to say, I really enjoyed our mediocre time together. Um, <laughs> make it authentic. Keep it shorter. Uh, honestly, be real. Um, it sucks when you have a bad experience and you are expecting a knockout of the park experience. All right. If you're a customer, that stinks. It's no fun. It is perfectly fine to be genuine and go, I don't know, something like, uh, you know, Steve, you know, I, thank you so much for your review. And honestly, I was not on my A game to be gay. I deserved this review. I appreciate your honesty and your willingness to send it. I really do. And I can tell you, I am going to be working my tail off to make sure that, because this is not the kind of person I want to be. All right, say that in two sentences. And people will read that and go, oh my goodness, this is a human, not a machine. And I would, I would respond to it something like that. That may or may not be appropriate with your situation, but George? Yeah, I, I think um, if the review is not up to where you want the review to be, right? If it's a two-star review and you really want your business to be a five-star review business, then I think you might even want to look at that two-star review as being a negative review or that three-star mm -hmm. review in your opinion is a negative review. So in that yep. case, I would go back to some of the stuff that we talked about earlier about how to respond to a negative review. I'm um, trying to yeah. get back to that slide. So you could say, you know, I really would like to make your next experience with us even better. Yes. I'd like to know what it is. Um, let's, let's talk about what it is I could do to make your business, your experience. The answer is yes. What is it that I could do to make your experience better? Yes, you do need to frame it in with that, though, Yes, because they're not, the mediocre reviews are challenging because they're not necessarily asking for a refund. They're not asking for a callback. They're just saying I had an average experience and it wasn't yep. what I expected. And so if you're going to respond with the whatever you want, the answer is yes, then um, do what George just did and frame it in with something first and just say, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't even know what you just said, George, if you could repeat it, but whatever it was, and then cap it off with, yeah, whatever you need, the answer is yes, but how can I make this better for you? Yeah. That was really good. Yeah. Well, and, there, and there's two things I'm, I'm pointing out there. One is that you're highlighting the idea that you want to do business with them again. Yes. And that this, this is a, this is a, again, for that reader outside, you're making the statement that this is a long-term relationship and clearly we're growing. Not every yeah. first date is perfect. <laughs> Um, but it does need to be the last date. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. So the final question that we have um, that was sent in is, uh, should I go back and respond to reviews that I got years ago? No. <laughs> um, I, I'm, an, I, I'm in agreement. No. Yeah. I'm trying to formulate why, but no. Sure. <laughs> 
Um, I, I think um, honestly, if you go back today and, re and write responses to every review you've ever had for the last two years, it'll be obvious via the timestamps to that third person viewer that something happened on that day in that month. Maybe you watched a webinar on this and you went back and wrote responses. And what you're also doing is you're triggering responses to all of those customers that say, hey, this guy who didn't respond to me two years ago just responded to your review. Um, so what I would suggest is really focus on the last 30 days and then move forward. And again, because you're focusing on getting new reviews from new customers, you're actually very quickly going to push those reviews you didn't respond to down to the bottom yeah. because you're yeah. building and building, building up. And so, yes, if somebody reads down to your very earliest review, they're going to see this, a shift happened. But mm -hmm. when, again, that third party story, as they're reading it, what they're seeing is this person became better at their relationships and this business became more personal. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to shift my initial answer of no to a no, maybe. <laughs> and the maybe there is in the situation where, like George just said, you, some of your reviews are recent. Um, yeah, go ahead and respond to the more recent ones. Those are fine. Um, that's absolutely par for the course. The challenge you're going to have if you're writing these in bulk, you cannot help but be repetitive your brain gets locked into these rhythms. So some of the authenticity in your response is that you're actually not doing this every day. Every review is different. You might respond to reviews every other day. And a lot happens in that 48 hour period to cause you to respond differently. It's gonna be blatantly obvious if you just put canned responses. And if you're doing the authentic responses we told you about earlier, there's no way you can even remember like, what was that one thing I really enjoyed about this appointment from this client two years ago? Uh, your response is just going to be, thank you for your business, and that's it. So at that point, I would say it's just not worth it. Just bury it, focus on new reviews, move forward. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us um, for this webinar on landing the first or for, on landing the five-star review. Um, hope you all have a good uh, rest of the day, wherever you are around the world, and stay safe. Take care. Thank you very much.